Hello and welcome to the TES Maths Podcast with me, Craig Barton. In this first podcast of the new school year, I'm looking back to what I and 40,000 other people from all over the world have been up to over their summer holidays. It's an online course from Stanford University called How to Learn Maths, run by Joe Bowler, an academic, author and former maths teacher. I was fortunate enough to be able to chat to Jo about the course and her philosophies about maths teaching. And at the end, you'll also be able to hear from three teachers who took the course with me to, to find out how it's affected their teaching. I'm delighted to be joined by Jo Bowler. Jo is currently Professor of Mathematics Education at Stanford University, and she has experience of teaching mathematics at comprehensive schools across London. She ran the How to Learn Maths online course over the summer. And Joe, if I could just start by asking you about that. Could you just give us a brief summary of what the main things you, what, why you wanted to run the course? What, what yeah. was important to you? So I've been working closely with Carol Dweck here at Stanford and she is a psychologist who's done a lot of work on mindset um, with amazing results that basically say that once kids believe that they can learn maths, amazing things happen. Their achievement goes up, they engage in more productive uh, behaviors and she and I sort of teamed together because I, I thought this is really significant for maths probably more than anything because that's the subject kids think you either can or you can't do it um, so I've been doing work with teachers I guess for a couple of years around these ideas and recently I've been going to conferences in the US where there's been thousands of people who in these huge rooms and walk out just saying wow you know if only I'd known this this is really important so I knew these ideas were really important for teachers they really appreciated hearing them they're not all going to come to conferences or be in Stanford so uh, I just thought it was perfect to put out online um, and I'd also another kind of important experience for me was I taught a class to freshmen at Stanford last year and um, it was a class of math traumatized Stanford <laughs> And I did a kind of three-way intervention with them to try and shift their uh, approach to maths. And we did maths together differently to the ways that they've done it. It was great. They really changed. And uh, I thought, well, I should m maybe do that for students, like other students. Sure. Um, so my long-term goal was to really do an intervention for students. And that, that was my next plan, is to do a course for students to shift the way they think. But then I thought, well, maybe over the summer I'll put out the ideas to teachers first. So it was crazy rushed. I decided to do it just in the last, like a few a month or so before it came out. So I, it wasn't perfect. I really uh, slogged through a lot of hours, evenings, and weekends to get it up. But um, it was great. I mean, the response from the people who took Absolutely. it was fun. Um, um, I'd just like to pick up on a couple of the ideas from it, if if that's okay. Sure. Um, one of the things that really struck me is, and you, you interviewed lots of students, but also people who are successful in, in lots of areas of life. And yeah. when they talked about the bad experiences that they'd had at school with mathematics and just how damaging that can be to them. And you've even mentioned yourself that at school, mathematics yeah. wasn't the way it was taught, wasn't something you particularly enjoyed. Could you just yeah. talk for a second just about how damaging it can be if people have a bad experience with mathematics? Yeah, sure. I mean you asked that because I think really for the last I don't know five years of my work I've more and more and more understood the widespread trauma out there and I've met I, I published a book called um, The Elephant in the Classroom in English and that was a different kind of book so that it was read by a lot of members of the public and um, I ended up being interviewed on lots of radio shows it was unbelievable even on Women's Hour <laughs> May, the amazing Jane Garvey who can, you know can talk on any subject and this is wonderful the, the interviews were all saying to me, God, you know, I can't even think about maths. It scares me so much. And there's so much trauma. And I, well, I guess what I particularly came aware of is how widespread it is, even amongst highly successful professional people. So um, I've really wanted to help with that. I think it's scandalous that we can do that to people through maths sure. teaching. Um, another one who uh, talks about his terrible experiences of maths is Lenny Henry. Yes, that's a super successful comedian. I mean, I mean, if you believe in people's smartness and all that, which I don't, but you know, comedians have to be at the top of the tree in the way that they can sure. do stuff. And he was absolutely, he will talk about how maths was just the worst experience because he couldn't do any of it. So, 
you know, top scientists. I, I used a woman in my course, Vivian Perry, who has an OBE from the Queen for her contribution <laughs> to science. And she will talk openly that maths is terrifying for her. Jeez. And you, you don't get that with other subjects, do you? Because I, I, I always yeah. notice it at parents' evening. Um, when I when I have a year eight parents or something like that, and they'll openly say, "Oh, I was never good at maths," and yeah. in in a way they wouldn't say about English or history, and I always think, I mean, it's, it's very difficult because you don't want to kind of get into a confrontation, but I always think that must be so damaging for the child just to hear that throwaway comment like maths is something that it's it's acceptable not to be not to be good at, and it's all right because mum and dad weren't good at it. Yeah. I think I put in the course, um, there was a, a study done which found that when mothers tell their daughters, I was no good at maths at school, their daughter's achievement immediately goes down in that same term. Jeez. So, yeah, I'm always talking to parents now about saying never say that to kids. You know, you put on your best acting, <laughs> whatever you have to do. And I, I tell them, you know, that when they come home and say, I've got maths homework, this is true. I always say to my kids, yay, I'm so excited. <laughs> let's, let's look at it together. And, you know, I teach parents, you've got to say this, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you've, you've touched on another point there that I'd like to bring up. And this is the, the and you mentioned this a lot in your book as well. And, and that's the difference between how boys and girls learn mathematics and how they respond better to different approaches. And and this is something that I, I must admit, before I'd read your book, I, I thought was kind of a bit of a myth. And I thought it was kind of, all right, you hear that boys are perhaps sometimes better at maths than girls or more numeric or something. But, but you cite kind of proper biological research that suggests that boys and girls do learn maths differently. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that's been coming out from the brain studies recently. When they give when they study through brain scans, people doing mathematical problems, it's really amazing, I think. They find that they come out with exactly the same scores, but the girls and boys use different pathways in their brains, uh, which is pretty big, it, you know. And I don't go, like to go too far down that route because I don't think it's good to prejudge sure. what girls and boys can do. And some books followed up from that saying, oh, because what they're showing is girls use more portions of the brain, which supports this whole brain stuff about girls being more connected uh brain brain pathways and boys being more focused in and people came out with books after saying oh girls should do practical maths with lots of discussions and boys should do you know just learn numerical stuff and that's crazy we don't want that um and we know that everybody is uh, advantaged by more um multi-dimensional maths approaches boys and girls so but yeah, I do think there are differences in the way people learn and, you know, girls and boys are part of that. And um, I think that maths is often taught in a way that is more oriented towards um, a masculine approach to learning, I guess. When I asked on, when I mentioned on Twitter that I was interviewing you, the single biggest question that people are asking, and this is it's very pertinent to me at the moment because this is a change that I'm trying to bring about in the school I work in. It's this setting versus versus mixed ability. Well, it's I mean, I, I say in my book that it, a lot of people go with setting because it seems to make sense. You know, you can target the work, you can have kids. But we just know from study after study after study that when kids are put in untracked or desetted groups, they do better. Uh, and they do better across the achievement spectrum from high to low end. Um, in fact, I worked with a school in Cambridge that has the top results in the country and has kids in mixed ability groups right the way through. Really unusual in England now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so... It, I have also worked in that way when I was teaching as a first year teacher in London, just out of my PGC course. Um, I remember, and obviously this was a formative experience for me, my very first lesson with the bottom set group who had just been put into sets and the kids saying to me, why should we bother? Yeah. And, you know, I didn't know what to say to them. It was hard. Um, but so we unsetted in that school, secondary school, and the achievement went up and you know, it shows in study after study. Now, I think now we understand that a big part of that is to do with mindset. That as soon as we put kids into groups, they develop a fixed, or, you know, it encourages fixed thinking about ability. Um, and it's very hard once you get the idea that you're uh, a low achieving group. And kids from the second set down will develop that idea. It, it then gets in the way of learning. 
interestingly, they've just well, what's just come out is that um, going into a top set also increases fixed mindset for mm. the kids, uh, uh, which is dangerous for them because once they start thinking, you know, I'm in this set because I'm smart, they then are on this precarious path of thinking I've got to keep showing I'm smart, and they don't venture into difficult situations. They won't take on more challenging problems. They start to only want to show um, what they know all the time, just get a whole range of bad learning patterns. So why, why is it you think that schools, if, or if the evidence suggests that mixed ability is the way forward, why is pretty much every school set it? Yeah, I mean, England's a particularly severe case of this. And I do think it's very cultural that it, people think, you know, um, that's the way it is. You go into sets, it works out what you can do, and then you do that. So um, I was in my own daughter's primary school in um, England. They put them into sets at age five. Which is, <laughs> Fair neck. Uh, <laughs> neck is right. Uh, <laughs> a lot of schools do that, and um, I, maybe not as early as five typically. But when we, I was at a parent uh, evening thing, and they were talking to the whole parents saying, we're going to put children into sets next year. Some, another parent, I was trying to keep my mouth shut, another parent put their hand up and said, um, what does that do to how they feel if they get, don't get put in the high group? And the teacher said, oh, we found that it, uh, the children appreciate knowing their place. It's good. Mm -hmm. And I think that people say that and think that's okay is, I mean, we do have a strong cultural view that there's, you know, a place for people and they're going to go in that way. So England is extreme. Um, they have tracking in the schools here where I work that typically starts at age 14 and they may put them into two groups. Right. But, you know, schools in England, putting them into sets at, a, you know, 11 typically and some of them are in six or eight groups, uh, I mean, we literally banging them over the head with fixed mindset messages, saying maths is all about whether you have it or you don't, where your ability is. So why doesn't it change? Very good question. Um, I think there aren't good routes for research to get to schools, which is another reason I did the online course. Teachers don't have time to read research articles. It's not set up in that way. So oftentimes schools don't know. It's also harder to teach mixed ability groups. What do you say to the, the, the kind of biggest criticism I've heard of, of mixed ability, and I must confess, I, I do see this a little bit myself when I watch mixed ability classes, is you get those students who get overshadowed by the kind of more able, the more vocal and the more confident. I mean, how, how do you make sure they're engaged in the lesson and can make a worthwhile contribution to the lesson? So, yeah, you have, I'm glad you asked that. You have to have teaching approaches that, that help with mixed ability teaching. So I always teach people to use complex instruction, which is a pedagogical approach designed to um, to deal with that, to, to challenge status problems in groups. So what we find is uh, the kids are given roles, so everybody has something specific to say. The math tasks are more open, which actually then you'll find, because teachers are valuing things like being able to explain and justify or show something in a different way, often it is not the high ability kids who, or the high achieving kids who now I'm getting into this. <laughs> the language it's not the high achieving kids who are always the best at that you know and other kids are able to show things but complex instruction is great it's in my book there's also books on complex instruction I think what you cannot just throw kids into mixed ability classes and let them get trampled on by the kids who have previously been very successful um, so it's a change in culture the schools that have been very successful here that I've worked with they untracked groups. They then spent 10 weeks not worrying about what maths the kids did. But they worked with them around norms of working groups, of listening to each other. The teachers do a lot of very deliberately valuing things that the lower achieving kids say when they say something good. And, um, you know, after 10 weeks, the kids are set to go. And then, I mean, they do math through that 10-week time, but they're not trying to cover particular things there. And those schools achieve at very high levels. So uh, it can be done. You need to change the culture, though, um, for kids and for um, and for teachers. When we did this work in Sussex, actually, we were working with schools up in the north of England as well, across the country, who did this detracking. And um, I remember interviewing the kids in one of the schools up north who were saying, you know, we really like the roles. 
Um, the roles just make things so everybody has something to do. Sure. The lower achieving kids don't feel bad or don't get trampled on. Um, so I think it's important to use those kind of strategies um, and to do it early. If you can do it from year seven, then kids are not already in patterns of Absolutely. looking down on other kids and they're all thinking some kids are smart and some kids aren't. What's your view of both homework and assessment? What what role does that have to play? Because the kind of tasks that you're advocating don't necessarily lend themselves in some right. people's eyes as well to, to being assessed and to kind of coming up with a level or a grade. And likewise, they're not ultimately the kind of tasks that kids are going to be examined on in our kind of GCSE system. So where do homework and assessment kind right. of fit into your way of thinking? Question. Um, the, first of all, we know from lots of studies that uh, stopping grading kids increases their learning and that grading is actually not good. Uh, you might want to give an end of year grade, but everything in between doesn't need grades at all. Um, the best thing to do is give kids feedback so that they can actually learn from that because a grade is often does nothing other than knock them over the head with another failure message. So I wouldn't have grades is one thing, but um, in... Uh, so homework, I mean, a lot of kids get just like really boring drill. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm working with teachers now who came up with a great homework, which I love. They do a lot of these bigger tasks and they were doing these great tasks in lessons and then giving them 20 questions to do for homework, which they weren't too happy with. And they've changed their homework now. They always, they have six questions. They always choose uh, two of them from their list. And the questions are things like... Uh, they Kids have a notebook. Questions are things like, what was the big idea that we learned in class today? Oh. Uh, or what are the things that uh, we've worked on that you're not understanding completely? Can you give an example? So it turns out this is fantastic for kids. This is what we want them to be doing, reflecting, not just going through exercises in class and then forgetting them. But And it's better, rather than having them practice more, when they can sort of switch off and do that, it's better to get them to write what are you understanding and what are you not uh, what were the big ideas today? So I love homeworks like that. Um, I'm not a big fan of homework per se. I think kids should have time at home to play and be children. Uh, particularly now I'm a parent of <laughs> homework, the most painful thing. Um, but so less homework or no homework would be my real what I would really like. But other than that, I think we take away that do, doing lots of practice for homework and have kids. And if they're writing about things, what they did in class today, what they learned in class, what's hard for them, parents can engage with that too, and they can really help them work on things. So I really like that. Well, Joe Bowler, thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us. We, we really, really appreciate that. After talking to Joe, I sat down with three teachers from my local area who also took the course. The first was Anton Lewis, a higher level teaching assistant in mathematics. Now Anton, uh, with myself, you did the Joe Bowler How to Learn Maths course over the summer. And I just, if possible, could you share your experiences that you've taken from the course and how that's worked out with your year seven and eight groups that you, that you teach? Uh, the year sevens, I think, come in and we presume they know very little due to the fact that they've been labelled with a level three, level four. From doing the course, the main thing that I learned was just to allow them to play with numbers. And one of the things that we did uh, with them every session is we started off with a number talk now. So I might just write up 18 times 5 on the board and then let them come up with different ways of being able to discover the answer to that in their head and then being able to share their methods with others, hopefully getting rid of the idea of using a, a grid method or a Chinese method or any sort of method that's that they've been taught and just being able to them explore it in their head, sharing them ideas and then being able to use them ideas in other questions. And have you found that these students in the past, these are the students that have always kind of fallen back into these formal methods for doing multiplication? They fall back onto the formal methods, uh, but the problem being is they can't actually remember which method to use and where. So they end up tripping themselves up all the time. Well, that's the thing. I mean, these kids from primary school have been labelled as low ability or, or low achieving students. And it's uh, when I spoke with Professor Bowler about this, these are the kids who, when they have intervention, it's normally with an adult. And the adult will sit there and say, right, for multiplication, 
this is the method that you use. For division, this is a method that you use. But what you're doing with these number talks is you're showing these kids, and it's not coming from you, it's coming from the kids themselves, that there's lots of different ways to approach these questions. So for 18 times five, I mean, when we did the talk for the parents, there was seven or eight different methods coming out. And if kids can be exposed to that, it makes such a difference to their flexibility with numbers. But as you say, it's the enjoyment, isn't it? Like, the kids are enjoying mathematics, aren't they now? They are, because they're getting the answer right. They don't feel there's any pressure on them to do it. Sir's way, or, oh, last year I was taught Mrs. Wayne, I've got to do it that way, but you're telling me another method, which method. It's now I'm just saying you can do anything you want to do. And as long as you're, you're getting to the right answer, then that's okay. And even if, and even if they don't get, get the right answer, I mean, that's the beauty of this, isn't it? Because the fact that it's coming from all different students and everyone's chipping in, it doesn't matter if kids are making mistakes anymore. No, and they, they're not, they, they might make their mistake, but then they can find out off another student how they did it, and then they relate to that rather than just going, I made a mistake with that method, I can't do that method, I can't do that method. Now they're actually seeing different methods about how to go around the question which is really good and it's actually, the other thing I like about it it's creativity because math sometimes isn't seen as a creative subject in the way that English might be or history might be but this is being creative I mean 18 times 5 looks like the most boring problem in the world but kids are pulling out all kinds of different methods and this isn't we're not just talking about top set kids here you're working with the kids that are really struggling the kids that are labelled early on as these level 3 level 4 kids who were going to really struggle to get a grade C at GCSE but these are the kids who are being exposed to these different methods, different ways of seeing things. And they're absolutely shining, aren't they? They are shining, and they're learning how to adapt to different questions as well. So from this 18 times, I've looked at the different methods. Today I threw up on the board, following still a scheme of learning, obviously, threw up uh, a division. How many threes go into 42? One student started counting up in threes. Another student decided they could do the bus stop method. About four students at this point said, I can't do the bus stop method, I, I, I can't do that. So then we said, how else can we do about it? And then all of a sudden they were still doing the, well, 10 times 3 is 30, 4 times 3 is 12, oh, that's 14. And then they can now they're seeing how to adapt maths to suit them to whatever strengths they have. And that's brilliant. I mean, that's linking together division with multiplication with addition. And it's, you're at, you've hit the nail on the head there, Anton. It's... It's not there's one method for doing this, one method for doing that. They're seeing maths as a whole kind of model, aren't they? And pulling in all yep. these different methods. The other, the other thing that I've, I've picked up from just speaking to you in these last few weeks is you, you're giving the kids, these kids that you work with, and again, we must stress here, these are the level three, level four kids that are identified from primary school as, as underachieving, that are struggling. You work intensively with them. Would you say you're giving them kind of more challenging and creative problems than you have done in the past? Definitely, I think previously I would have looked at maybe through training this is just giving them methods and being able to go over the methods and then giving them rules that they have to remember. Here it's, it's completely different. We've been told just give them a problem and just give them time, let them solve it. If they need a bit of help, only give them a bit of direction. Don't tell them the answer, don't tell them a method. And from this, one of my lessons, we were looking at. Um, factors of numbers and looking in particular at the primes. So what I did, I just gave them the numbers 1 to 20, allowed them to work out different ways of multiplying to make each of these numbers, looked at the numbers that were that were used, found out that certain numbers have different numbers, and we, we decided that he liked to tell them these were called factors, and yes. they remembered this from primary school, but they couldn't remember what a factor was. No, of course. Interesting now is I'd like to go back three weeks down the line, I, th I think they now remember what a factor is, because they've done it in a practical uh, way. Once we did this, we um, looked at the different amount of factors in each one, and this was led by them, not myself, and they came up with a definition that certain numbers, being 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, <laughs> um, are prime numbers. And they didn't give them a prime number example, but they, they came up with this definition of uh, certain numbers have two factors which is better than one in itself. They didn't necessarily like that. There was no tripping over one. One was never mentioned in all of this. Um, they then researched where one was unique, and they actually realised that it had an odd amount of, of factors, but so did four, nine, sixteen. 16. And then I was like, well, they're actually square numbers. And from that, this is, like I said, level three, level four students researching this themselves, seeing how it works, seeing what it means, uh, and really enjoying it because they... They can do, they can multiply numbers. Ask them to find factors straight off, they're switched off. Absolutely. They're disengaged. Here they're going, oh, I know how to make that, I know how to make that. And they're, they're putting their hands up, they're, getting, they're joining in. As before, they were, like I said, virtually in tears. 
one of the key ideas from the course that, that I really picked up on is this idea of this growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And uh, you're a bit of a philosopher yourself, Mr. Lucy, and you came up with a bit of a quote, didn't you? That was something along the lines of, your students can't have a growth mindset if the teacher doesn't have a growth mindset. Now, what, what, what did you mean by that? Because I think you're absolutely spot on with this. Well, first of all, I want, I, I want all staff to have an expectation that students can achieve. I think, let's go pre this year for myself, I was definitely in that case. But the way that I did it was I thought I had to teach them a method and allow them to practice it and practice it. But that was the wrong part. I, I did want the best of the kids, but, and I think most staff do, and they'd give up the time and stuff, but you've got to plan your lessons accordingly. I think this here is one way of allowing students freedom for them to explore maths. And you've got to be very flexible as a staff doing it this way. I think you've got to be able to go off on tangents that are obviously still connected with maths. They're not completely random topics, but allow your lessons to go that way. Students will then find out stuff. You can bring it back at another time. You can start the next lesson going where you wanted to, but you've just got to allow students to explore different areas of maths. And that only comes from a growth mindset. So it only comes from staff being willing to learn from the kids as well as the kids learning from you. That's brilliant. Anton, thanks so much for taking time to speak to us. Thank you. I also spoke to Gareth Fairclough, a maths teacher from the same school as Anton. I studied the course over summer and one of the main things that I got from it was the idea of fixed and growth mindsets. Perfect. Do you want to tell us what you what you think that means? Um, well, a fixed mindset I took from it as being uh, somebody that struggles to think conceptually about maths. Somebody who struggles to um, be creative with maths, I think. They're very fixed in the way they do things. Whereas someone with a growth mindset will try and have a go at things. They may struggle at first, but they'll carry on and carry on and carry on. And that's what I perceive a growth mindset to be. And have you, did you pick up on any ways from the course of promoting this kind of, this growth mindset? Because I think you're absolutely right. A lot of, a lot of students are, oh, they're fixed in the methods, they're fixed in their aspirations. But we've seen from the course, the, just the benefits that instilling this growth mindset can have. But one of the main things I took from it was, um, promoting that mistakes aren't a bad thing, they're a good thing. Um, a lot of the, the kids in some of my classes, they tend to just cross the work out. Um, make, you, you, didn't, you don't want you to see it at all, whereas I'd love to see the mistakes and see what they've done, because I think that's really valuable. And I've been sort of um, getting them to share their mistakes in classes more, taking time out of class time to uh, just to say, right, who, who's made a mistake and what things can we learn from it? You're right, it's about, it's about promoting that mistakes are a good thing, aren't they? And you, you, I, I don't know if you find this, Gaz, as well, but it's the top set kids that I find are the most reluctant to make mistakes and share mistakes, but we can learn so much from them. So how have you actually kind of got across that mistakes are a good thing and, and got your kids to share them? Well, just sort of explain that um, it's a learning journey, really, and that mistakes are, are valuable things. Um, People are going to make mistakes throughout their lives and everything, so if we can spot sort of mistakes in the maths that we're doing, somebody else might have that same mistake and they learn something as well. So it's all about sharing and spotting mistakes and trying to overcome them really. Perfect. And have you noticed a difference in your students this year since you've kind of adopted this strategy? Yeah, definitely. It's taken a while to, for it to come into play properly, but um, they are sort of coming around to it now. Um, the more willing to share the mistakes, whereas certainly the last few years I've been teaching at the start of this year, they were really sort of they didn't really want to show the mistakes really. Perfect. Now, there's a couple of ideas that I know really kind of struck a chord with both of us from the course, and we, we've incorporated incorporated them into our brand new year seven and eight scheme of work. So, could you just talk about a couple of those, if that's all right? Yeah. Um, two of the main things that I think that pupils need to have in maths is a sense of number and a sense of being able to identify patterns. Um, these are two fundamental things in maths that they need to know. So let's talk about the, let's, let's do the, the sense of number first. And if you just explain what we've tried to do in our year seven and eight now, what happens every week? Well, every week we um, put up a picture on the board um, of some items. So the first week was six containers with 
loads of cheese balls in cheesy there. Balls. Cheesy balls. Um, and the pupils had to have an estimate, make a guess of how many think how many balls there would be in all of the containers. So it was hard at first because they just wanted to choose a random number. But that's when we started questioning, saying things like, well, what number's too high, what number's too low? Just getting them to think a little bit more about making a really good estimate. Um, and then, once they've had a little estimate, um, we really answer and we see how close or how far they are away I mean, from the answer. You had a good idea as well, didn't you, that you collected all those estimates in and worked out the class's average estimate and found that more often than not, the, av the average estimate was better than a lot of the individual efforts. And the kids have responded very well to the, this. I mean, we do these once a week with Year 7 and 8, and they're excited about them, aren't they? Yeah, well, I took that um, that idea about average from a lesson that actually you delivered to us last year about um, the National Lottery. Ah, yes. And to do with wisdom of the crowds. That's right. Um, and I remember doing that with them, the class last year, and they absolutely loved it, where we got them to work out the average for their lottery picks. We picked six numbers, put the uh, ticket on, and we actually got four numbers, which was quite good. Um, so they remembered that from last year. So bringing that into a different sort of type of maths is really good. So I've started doing a um, class average versus yourself each week, just to see if their guess is better or worse than the class average. And it's brilliant because it's every kid can access it, can't it? Because every kid can make a guess. And it's it, the key thing for me is it's the kids justifying the reasons and sharing with other kids how they've made the guess. So, for example, with the cheesy balls, we get some kids almost trying to count layers. We have some kids using perceptions of the size of things. We've got a toilet roll one, haven't we? I think that's this week's one. And you've got kids coming and going home. I mean, uh, one member of staff was telling me that they were, uh, one of their kids was in the supermarket the other day and was saying to the mum that the, the roll of toilet roll on Asda's shelf didn't have enough sheets in it because the one that we're using at school, he reckoned they had like 300. So kids are, kids are taking these estimates and they're, they're talking about them in class. You as numeracy coordinator, you've, you've, you stick up the estimate, don't you? That's and, right. Yeah. On the board, on the maths corridor. And we get kids talking about it. You send it around to staff so staff can have estimates. And it's just... That was one of the main things for the course for me. It's getting kids engaged in maths and talking about maths. And the kids are learning from each other and they're looking forward to these estimates every single week. I mean, yeah, it's something that they're not going to do in a regular maths lesson. They haven't done this before, so it's something completely new, completely different, and it's quite a challenge for them in some respects. Um, you know, they're not, some of them in my class every day were saying that they don't know how many sheets are on this toilet roll, but I was encouraging them to have a guess and think logically. And that's when they started to discuss in little groups their experiences this week with toilet paper. But, you know, it's been staples, cheesy balls, things like that. You know, these are things that they have some sort of um, dealings with in real life. Absolutely. And another of our members of staff, Rebecca, who's uh, she's in her second year, she had an excellent idea, and I've, I've, I've used this myself, and she, she gets kids to do, do an estimate. And then keep, keep their answer in their head. And then they have to turn to the person next to them and share their estimates. And then they together have to come up with a joint estimate between the two of them. And then those two then take that joint estimate and face the two people across from them. And they have to come up with a, a kind of group of four consensus. And it's tricky because kids have to then argue mathematically. They have to talk maths to each other. Do they average their estimates? Is one person's way of guessing better than the other? And they're just bringing in so much different areas of maths and just talking about it, enjoying it. And like, I don't know about you guys, but like I've, I've noticed a real buzz around our year sevens and eights this year. And I think these, this weekly estimate has, has a large part to play in it. Yeah, I mean, it's all about uh, increasing the profile of the maths department, really, things like that. So um, doing different, you know, out of the box things like that is only going to benefit the pupils, really. Absolutely. And it's, we're not using it as a gimmick. It's... Once a week, every single year, seven and eight class is exposed to it, and kids are talking about maths. And for me, from the course, that was one of the main things get them engaged. Guys, thanks for taking the time to join us. You're welcome. Finally, Claire Green shared her experiences of the course. Claire and myself did the Joe Bowler course over the summer holidays. And my first question to you is, what impact has it had on your teaching so far? 
I think I've been a lot more aware of how kids learn maths, which is the whole point of the course, but how obviously there's so many different ways you can reach an answer. So the number talk was particularly one uh, aspect of the course which I loved and I've tried that with number, uh, special mellow set year 10s, getting them really to deconstruct the numbers when like multiplying or adding, you know, to break the numbers down. But I've also done it with algebra and like substitution and oh, stuff. Oh, I'll tell you what, because we've, uh, we've heard from Gaz about using it with the number, but not, not with the algebra. So can you just talk us through what you've, what you've done with that? Yeah, I did something simple as just A plus B equals 21. And then right. I asked the year nines to write down as many values as they could think of for A and B, which obviously there's an infinite amount. And then I said, well, what happens if I take away the 21? But I then changed the A to, you know, a, a nine, and yes. they were like, "Well, that doesn't really mean anything," and, you know. So we discussed if, it, you know, I then put the twenty-one back on. The, you could then find a value for B. So what we're doing then, we're solving. So then, obviously, I changed it back to took the equal sign away, and said, "Well, if I give you say B could be ten, what would my answer be?" And then they very quickly got the idea that the letters when you substitute in don't have a value it's a value that they give and they have this infinite because they, they like solving they always want to find the value for b yes. the value for x so they quickly grasp that they can be this infinite number that's interesting because that was something that yeah it really i picked up from the course was that kids do think there's just one value that yeah. x can be or something but of course letters are variables that's that's really interesting and how have you have your kids kind of responded to that yeah they did really well especially with substitution because they're very quickly grasp then that you know you do replace the letter with the number and and go on from there but understood that you can have like say multiple values for x and it's dependent on what you're doing you know if, if it's plumbers how much you're charging an hour or and everything like that so it did it really helped with the formula and substitution and in terms of the kind of the way the lessons run are they happy kind of sharing their ideas and coming to the front are they quite comfortable with yeah. doing that yeah it's something we've done in school for a while is to try and encourage discovery and you know investigation anyway within lessons so this is kind of added to that and they love show, you know showing you that they've got a different way of doing it and oh, I did it this way and I did it that way and even when they're the same but the numbers are just the other way around you're like no no you know well done it's you're almost there but and yeah I, it's good and I think what's lovely about that is we, we we do the number talks once a week with year seven and eights but you've shown there that with the older students yeah. it works just as well and it's, it's just as important it's, it's never too old you're never too old to learn how to break numbers down and, and share different methods yeah but there's so many days, ways to do different things. It was we I accidentally stumbled across one with um, my second set tens at the top because we were doing percentages and something as simple as you know how do you find fifty percent of something? There was about five different ways of, of doing it. You know, some found ten percent, some halved it, some found one percent, some used a multiplier, yeah. and it was interesting to see all these different ways and see they're all right. That's right, and it's it's that they're all right, and they all must be equivalent to each other, so we can discuss why that's the case. And it's giving the kids this kind of flexible toolkit to, to know that perhaps this method will be quicker and more efficient this time, sometimes I'll use this method, and not getting them fixed in just one rigid way of doing yeah. things. Well, that, that's superb. Uh, what, what else did you pick up from the course that you've used? The main idea that... Obviously, your brain grows when you learn something new, which I love, because the kids are always telling you maths is hard, this is yeah, really yeah. hard. So at least now we can say, well, your brain's going to grow more than it does in English, for example, and pick on English a bit. But I used it in a lot in the introductory lessons and kind of asked them what they thought of maths and, like, say, how media portrays maths. What did they get from this advert? You know, when have they ever heard maths in a good light or a bad light? And then tried to kind of turn the negatives into positives. So when they do say... You know, oh, it's a bit boring. Well, you know, we, we're going to try and make it more interesting. We're going to try these investigations. We find it really hard. Well, yes, it is difficult, but it doesn't mean that you're bad at it. You know, difficult is good because your brain grows and explained all that. So, yeah, I think you dealt with quite a few misconceptions because maths does have a bad rap and it, it annoys me so oh, much. It does, <laughs> absolutely does my head in. And it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? You, um... It, it has probably the worst reputation of all the subjects. And it was fascinating to me, the interviews that Joe did on the course, with people who'd just been, they'd been damaged yeah. by bad experiences of mathematics at school. And, and Joe herself talked about how she hated maths at school, the way it was taught. And they can mess you up for life, can't yeah. it? It's, well, it's, it's a scary thing. Now, am I right in thinking that in year seven, you start your students off? In mixed ability groups? Yeah, we have a top and a bottom. 
um, because it's important, obviously, to mainly for the bottom, really, to isolate those. Not isolate sounds awful, but (laughs) to um, separate those that obviously come in on below level three or below level four to um, obviously start basic work with them. But yeah, otherwise they're in forms, so they sit with the pupils in forms, and we do project-based work for the first half term. Now this year they are being set as of um, next week, which is the seventh. Yeah of October, which is a, usually a bit earlier than, than usual. But yeah, it's what's quite nice. We have these, like say, low barrier, high ceiling tasks, which all the pupils can really enjoy and access. And do you find, because one of the big criticisms that people have of mixed ability is that the kids who are the low, perceived to be the lower ability students or the lower achieving students, they get overshadowed in the, in the group situation and they, they can't kind of get their voice heard and it's the higher ability or higher achieving students who tend to kind of do all the work and have the confidence. Do you, do you find that that's the case and do you have kind of ways of making sure that the group situation in mixed ability is a bit more inclusive? I think, I think it depends on uh, the class, but the year seven class I've got at the moment range from, I think... 3A to 5A, like the levels that they're on. But I actually don't find much difference in like the confidence in speaking. And, and you find actually the lower ability ones are very keen to show that they can do it as well as the brighter ones. We use, obviously I don't, I insist on no hands up in the classroom anyway, so you can always select the pupils to answer. And we use Lollipop 6 as well to randomly select names, which is always a good idea because it kind of stops the brighter ones shouting out then and they're more willing to wait and see if their name's going to come out. But they love coming up to the board and, and demonstrating, all, you know, from all abilities. And it's good to boost the confidence, I think, of the maybe the weaker ones by getting them up, maybe doing the slightly easier questions, but demonstrating it. And it really massively improves their maths as well as the others. And if that's the case, because I'm torn by this clan myself, Joe makes the point in the course that it should be mixed ability all the way through, possibly up till about maybe year 10, 11, where then it's set it and focus on the, the exam that you're going to be taking. If you had your way, would you keep them in mixed ability? And if so, how long would you, would you do it for? Probably up to the end of year eight. But again, probably splitting the top and the bottom, you know, take them apart. But yeah, probably to the end of year eight. Because I think year nine, you start doing a lot more GCSE work and then maybe it's important to kind of distinguish those that you really want to get the C's and those that should be pushing on for, for higher. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because when it works, and I know it splits it splits the teaching community, this, this concept of mixed ability, but when it works in its ideal world, it's the higher ability kids working in groups with the, I shouldn't keep saying higher ability, the higher achieving students working in groups with the lower and middle achieving students and then learning off the, the higher students and the higher students as well having to deepen their knowledge by explaining misconceptions and trying to explain things in different ways. When it works at its best, it works really well. And I, I'm, I'm leaning towards thinking, why do we have to even kind of, take them off in year nine or year ten well, why can't it just work all the, all the way through yeah true i do think we have bands in us we have like an upper band and a lower band i think most schools do and they set it within that and it's so important for the top band to stay in the top band doesn't matter if they're the bottom set of that band and what we find actually because they set it maybe on english or science they might not be necessarily set on maths that the lower band top set are actually brighter and more high achieving than the top band lower set right but you'll find your bottom band automatically think they're stupid because they're in this bottom band and you hear it time and time again well well i'm you know i think i don't get it i'm in this band and you're like no it's not the case so yeah maybe mixing them up therefore would would stop that and we have something at the moment something um i pioneered last year it's worked really well which is a peer mentoring scheme so those pupils in year seven, eight, and nine who are identified as underachieving, yeah. the year sevens at the moment who've come in on lower than level four, team up with our top two set year tens or yeah. our top set year nines, uh, one form time a week and do a bit of extra maths just to help them improve. And you find that your brighter ones, your top two sets, the mentors, actually find it probably more difficult than the mentees yeah. because they've got to go back to this basic maths, you know, nothing complicated, but explain it and really explain how Absolutely. to do it to these people who, you know, are struggling. And it stretches them just as much as it stretches the low ones. And oh. obviously that could happen in the classroom. Absolutely. It's a tricky one. And I think we'll, the, this mixed ability thing will, uh, will turn up time and time again. Okay. 
As you can hear, the course has certainly had an impact on those who took it over the summer. And if you yourself took it, then why not join in on the discussion on our podcast page? And that's all the time we have for this podcast. You can find the links to all the resources and ideas mentioned throughout the show at our dedicated podcast page. That's www.tesconnect.com forward slash maths podcast. You can join in the discussion there or send me a tweet at tesmaths where you'll also find daily resource recommendations. Finally, if you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a moment to rate and review it on iTunes. And I'll be back next month with more mathematical mutterings. But for now, take care and goodbye.